This is El Campo, Texas, once the heart of the historic Texas rice belt. But many of the rice mills have been abandoned. For Ed Gangle, a tenant farmer who has worked these fields for over four decades, there is less land to grow rice on every year. All this year was in rice for the last, uh, since World War II. He used to farm this field, but it's not for rent anymore. The reason? It isn't drought or blight or any other natural disaster. It isn't even about Texas. It's about Washington. This is where they make the laws that govern farming, and where the Washington Post's Dan Morgan began covering farm policy in the 1970s. One of the troubles with the farm program is it's a hodgepodge. It's not one program. A loan deficiency payment, the livestock compensation program, price support, subsidized crop insurance, disaster relief programs. So it's one program kind of layered on another. Years ago, Morgan became convinced that the nation's farm bills, particularly its farm subsidies, were the source of an enormous waste of taxpayer dollars, potentially billions. His evidence? A particular kind of farm subsidy known as the loan deficiency payment, the LDP. The LDP is not something that has a household name in Washington or New York, but out in the farm country, it's, it's the discussion that every football Friday night football game, uh, you know, everybody's talking about what's the LDP this week. With the LDP, farmers can collect a subsidy when the market price of their crop dips below a government set floor price. This way, when prices are low for crops, the government steps in and makes up the difference. But, Morgan learned, there's a way to make a killing on the LDP. You can get the subsidy, pocket the subsidy, wait for the price to go up, and then sell later. There's big money in this. I maybe scratched my head a little bit because I said, isn't the LDP supposed to compensate farmers who are losing money? Back in 2000, Morgan wrote a memo to the Post's national editors. He told them about $8 billion worth of farm subsidies, taxpayer dollars, and how a lot of it was going to those who knew how to, quote, game the system. He wanted to do the story. His editors did not. I think I mentioned the LDP. That was probably a big mistake because once you start throwing those acronyms around, people's eyes glaze over and they, it's hard for them to understand uh, you know, what may be behind that. But Morgan wouldn't take no for an answer, and in 2005 he pitched the story again, this time to the paper's top investigative editor, Jeff Lean. Dan came to me with a memo that I have to confess sounded and looked like it was written in Greek. But I knew from Dan, and I knew from my experience with, with working on really tough subjects, that something was there. My instinct, my spider sense just told me that something was there. So Dan set it up for us to go to the USDA, which is based here in Washington. We met with a senior official, and he was very blunt. He said, this is a broken system. Jeff didn't say much. I didn't know what he thought. We took a taxi back to the post, and as soon as we got in the taxi, he said, that's a project. Jeff Lean assigned two reporters to join Dan Morgan on the project. Two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, Gil Gall, and former government economist turned reporter, Sarah Cohen, an expert in data analysis. I quickly discovered that she could, could crack codes, that's what she did, literally, with computer-aided re reporting. We were going to need that. That was obvious because one of the things you're dealing with in, in, the, in the farm programs is massive amounts of, da of data. To crack the Farm Bill code, Cohen would have to make sense of a database of 217 million individual subsidy payments that the Department of Agriculture, the USDA, had shelled out over 15 years. This is the amount that the person got. In this case, it's $163,700. Um, this is the date they got the check. And this big number over here is the identifier that tells you who got the check. 
The Post began its investigation by examining a kind of subsidy born in 1996. The Republican-controlled Congress, critical of what it termed big government, wanted to wean farmers off subsidies and to encourage them to grow whatever the market demanded. But to get votes, the reformers had to make trade-offs, with farm state congressional Democrats and Republicans bent on maintaining payments to their farmers. The result was a classic Washington compromise. One kind of subsidy was ended, but in exchange, a new subsidy was created, one that paid farmers not for the crops they grew, but for the land they owned. That compromise now costs taxpayers billions. The taxpayers spend more than $5 billion a year paying farmers not on what they grow, but on what farms grew in 1996. They took a sort of a snapshot of American farms and said, how many acres, if you, if you grow 100 acres of corn, those are your base acres. And we're no longer going to tell you what to plant on those acres. You can plant corn, you can plant nothing but we're still going to send you a check to support your income. Dan Morgan wanted to know more. Wandering the back halls of Congress, he got a tip. I nosed around up on Capitol Hill and, and found a guy, a, a member of a staff, who said, you ought to go down and look at rice production area near Houston. The people are being paid down there. They're getting checks for the government covering 500,000 acres of rice. But guess what? There's only less than 200,000 acres being grown now, and yet and yet uh, they're still receiving these payments. Morgan and his colleague Gil Gall headed for rice country to investigate. In El Campo, Texas, they met Ed Gangle, the rice farmer who can no longer rent the land he used to farm. It's just right. another example of what's happened to the Texas rice industry. Yeah. No one farms here now. Yet the owner still receives a subsidy, what's called a direct payment from the feds. On this farm, he's receiving somewhere around a little over $10,000 for not having a farmer out here. He runs his own cattle on it. He can do that or lease it out or actually do nothing at all with the land and still be better off than having a farmer on, it, on the land. At a roadside restaurant, Ed Gangle arranged for the reporters to meet more struggling local farmers. What happened was we showed up and Ed had lined up like a dozen farmers, most of whom were young. And we were around a buffet and people were eating and talking loudly. And then eventually one guy down at the end of the table mentioned, well, you should go look at these, these mansions out on these old rice fields. They're collecting government payments because they were built on these old rice fields and they qualified. And, you know, I, I just kind of looked at them like he was nuts and thought to myself, no way. And I remember Gil walking into one of the government offices down there and, and he saw posted on the bulletin board some real estate broker's cards. By talking to the real estate agent, Gil was able to pin this down and uh, was told that, uh, yeah, you'd be able to, to live on the one acre and collect government payments on the other nine acres. They call these cowboy starter kits. The term cowboy starter kit meant a tract non-farmers could buy with enough room to build a house and still keep a horse out back. And it was used as a marketing tool. In essence, buy this land and get a free annual federal subsidy. It looked like they're trying to divide it up to me in, in about uh, uh, at least 10 acre tracks, or maybe like they're going to cut it in half. And the, that's their deal. They want some elbow room, and, and they would right. like a five or 10 acre track. But in order to know how much federal money was going into the cowboy starter kits, Gilgal would first need to know who owned them. And he knew which local official would give him the information. If you want to know anything about who owns what land in a community, you go to the tax appraiser first. And um, a lot of them are excited to, to actually see a reporter because they've never seen a reporter before. <laughs> and they're sort of shocked that anybody would want to ask them a question. Armed with names and addresses, Sarah Cohen was able to cross-reference them with her database of 217 million payments from the USDA. She began to identify who was getting subsidies and how much it was costing taxpayers. 
Among the USDA payments Cohen found was nearly half a million dollars that had gone to a Texas physician for his 10,000 acres of former rice land. This is supposed to be a safety net, but it's not a safety net. You're not saving anybody. You're saving a surgeon in Houston. The Post would report that in Texas as recently as 2005, $37 million was paid out to owners whose land was once planted with rice, but is no longer. In fact, the state now had more former rice land than current rice land. On July 2nd, 2006, the Post published the first report in a series called Harvesting Cash. The investigation into direct payments found that nationally, more than $1.3 billion over six years had been paid to people who were doing no farming at all. The first farm bill was passed in the 1930s, during the Depression, when one in four Americans lived on farms. The intention was to provide subsidies for key crops like cotton and corn, to protect farmers from economic hardship and natural disasters. In some instances, that's still the case, but as the Post team continued reporting, they found troubling story after troubling story. What we found was that the way that farm policy had grown up over the decades, uh, it had created a number of what I would call absurdities. And these absurdities were done for political reasons, they were done with good intentions, they were compromises to get bills passed, but however they occurred, uh, they were, in the end, Kafka-esque. The Post didn't just identify over a billion dollars for farmers who don't farm. They would soon uncover hundreds of millions in drought relief, where there had been no drought. In 2002, the White House and the USDA came up with a $750 million fund to aid ranchers and dairy farmers who suffered economic damage from drought. It was called the Livestock Compensation Program. What we're here today to announce um, is an important step that this administration is taking to assist livestock producers who have been particularly hard hit as a result of the severe drought conditions. The Post would report it was no coincidence. The program arrived in time to help a Republican Senate candidate in an election year, and the politicking was just beginning. Once the USDA had announced this program, right before the 2002 election, Everybody wanted a piece of it. And everybody would get a piece of it in 2003 when politicians in Congress expanded the program. They removed the restriction that there actually had to be a drought and said that any kind of declaration would make the counties eligible for funds in the second year. In other words, whether they had suffered losses or not, livestock owners could collect as long as the feds declared some kind of disaster. On February 1st, 2003, the space shuttle Columbia broke up upon re-entering Earth's atmosphere. For all of America, it was a tragedy. But for cattle owners in East Texas, where some of the debris fell, it was also the beginning of a livestock compensation boondoggle. In order to recover debris and pay emergency costs, President Bush declared a disaster. And that disaster declaration, the reporters discovered, had triggered livestock compensation payments in East Texas, despite the fact that NASA itself would say the shuttle disaster had caused little damage on the ground. But who had received the payments? Had they gone to people who suffered no losses? And how much had the government paid out? Reporter Gil Gall figured it was the public's money. It ought to be public information. It wasn't. The USDA didn't know and wouldn't say because it didn't really, it didn't really keep the information that way. To follow the money, Gil Gall first needed to rule a few things out. He knew farmers and ranchers in East Texas might have qualified for livestock compensation payments if they had suffered legitimate losses from non-shuttle disasters, including drought. Sarah and I put together a map where the shuttle explosion, you know, occurred in East Texas. I also went and looked at drought records, and I looked at rainfall records for each of those counties. 
And so I knew that in, you know, in Chandler, Texas, they hadn't had a drought in three years, but yet they had awarded a million dollars to farmers and ranchers in these livestock compensation programs. What the reporters learned was startling. The area in white is where there had been little or no drought over a two-year period. But each black dot represented a quarter of a million dollars in livestock compensation payments. I then went into our database. I could identify farmers who got payments in that area, but I still you know, wasn't exactly sure why they had qualified. When I picked up the phone and called the farmers, I would get to a point in the interviewing process where I would say, and why were you eligible for this? And the farmers would hem and haw, but eventually they would say, well, you know, I don't really know, but I think it was because the shuttle exploded. But how had these farmers even known they were eligible for federal subsidies? They would have been told by, their, by the local county office that they now qualified for the livestock compensation program. The county executives were federal employees, representatives of the USDA based in Texas. Now, Gil Gall had some questions for them. I would call up and would be told, well, I've been told I can't talk. Oh, who told you that? The state office of the Farm Service Agency, which is USDA. Oh, really? Yeah, we got a memo. Oh, can you send me a copy of that memo? And a couple of the people sent me copies of the memos. Federal officials in the Texas USDA office sent out detailed instructions on how to handle inquiries from the Washington Post. They included keep the interview positive, simple, brief, and accurate. Do not be evasive, but don't volunteer information. And silence is okay. One man who got that message also got several calls from Gil Gall. Blake English was the county executive for the Farm Service Agency in Denton County, Texas. He felt like it was his duty as a public servant that he owed it to the taxpayers to explain to the extent that he could what had occurred. I will not lie to protect my own rear end. I'll be darned if I would lie for someone else. And, and this was uh, sort of the, the feel that I had was uh, cover for us. This might be an embarrassment to us. Blake English is retired now and living in Oregon, where he spoke with Exposé. He was still on the job in Texas when he talked to Gil Gall. Blake didn't go out of his way to volunteer information about why they qualified, but he would give me a hint that, well, had I read the county minutes? And I said, okay, you know, uh, I'll send a Freedom of Information Act request. And looking at the minutes, there was this wonderful discussion in which Blake English said that we don't even know why we qualify for this money, but we've been told by the state office that we're eligible now and that we should be looking for a disaster to, to qualify our farmers. The state office was saying that and with the space shuttle declaration, maybe you should uh, use that as a basis for our eligibility in the livestock compensation program. I thought it was ludicrous. But why would authorities want to send disaster payments to people who hadn't suffered? Blake English suspects an old-fashioned horse trade. There is a mindset within the bureaucracy maybe that says that uh, if you obtain these federal dollars for a particular area, then it's one that you can proudly say, look what I've done for you. Therefore, when November comes around, we want your vote. The, the uns unspoken part. Blake English knew he had little choice but to fill out the paperwork that led to the release of $433,000 to ranchers in Denton County. Henderson County netted over 700000 one rancher there, who had suffered no damages, told the Post, quote, Believe me, we would be better off if the government limited the payments to those who really need them. He received $40,000 in disaster compensation. The paper would report, For hundreds of ranchers from East Texas to the Louisiana border, the shuttle explosion opened the door to about $5 million. John Johnson 
A top official at the USDA acknowledges there are legitimate questions about the livestock compensation program. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, Congress writes the legislation. It's embodied in a much bigger piece of legislation. And the president decides to sign that piece of legislation for a variety of reasons that may be much broader than strictly agricultural policy. And once that becomes the law of the land, I don't have any discretion of how I carry that program out. If Congress has said that I have to make all livestock eligible in every county where there's a disaster declaration of any type, I have no discretion about that. No, I'm not trying to blow the whistle, but, but I do insist on some integrity in the programs. Without that integrity, we lose, uh, we lose any future programs. If we cry wolf too many times that we've got a disaster here, and then we look at the disaster as a space shuttle disaster, then the connection between that and a farm disaster makes it uh, hard to get another disaster program approved even if we need it, need it desperately. The shuttle payments in East Texas were a tiny fraction of huge government payouts from a program originally designed to provide drought relief. The reporters knew because once again, they had followed the money. All of the areas in green here now are places that got money from this program, but never had a serious drought. In Washington state, Ranchers in one county received $1.6 million for an earthquake that caused them no damage. In Wisconsin, a winter snowstorm triggered millions of dollars more. To me, the, uh, the fascinating thing about the, uh, the livestock compensation program, when you think about it in the larger sense, is it's, it's kind of indicative of what happens in Congress. The farm lobby is very important and powerful, and so Quite often, these programs are just ways to get money into rural areas. Often, the real, the bottom line is how do we get money to out, out into these areas and not, does this make good policy sense? Is this a good policy? The Post found that all told, $635 million went to livestock owners across the nation who suffered little or no damage from drought. And that $635 million was just a drop in the bucket of farm bill misspending that the Post uncovered. The paper's findings included $3.8 billion corn farmers got in subsidies in 2005 by simply playing the LDP, that is, collecting a subsidy when corn dipped below its floor price, then selling when the price went up again. $9 billion in disaster payouts to farmers, most of whom were already covered by subsidized federal crop insurance. And $400 million worth of powdered milk, millions of pounds of it, the government gave away free to feed cattle during a drought. Instead, ranchers, feed dealers, and brokers made millions by selling it in Mexico, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and the Philippines. There's a real pattern in these stories, which is in order to get money to somebody that it's intended to get to, you send a whole bunch of money to people it was never intended to get to. Tallied up, the Post had identified over 15 billion taxpayer dollars spent on what it called wasteful, unnecessary, or redundant expenditures. For 43 years, I've been able to make a living farming. It's a, it's a profession that I like and love and would love to continue to do. And when you see a program that uh, rewards somebody for doing nothing, it seems very unfair to me.